Well, nerds, I have a special treat for you today. We have Lan He Chen, who is running for controller for the state of California, but he brings with him uh, uh, an amazing resume uh, of uh, not only academic achievement, but having worked uh, closely with both Romney, but also being appointed on a commission by Obama. He's uh, spent some time with Andrew Yang, and uh, I've seen him on my favorite show uh, since I was in high school. My favorite show ever is Meet the Press, and I've seen Lonnie a few times on that show. So as a political junkie, it's a great pleasure to have Lonnie on the cha on the channel. Um, hello, nerds, and welcome, Lonnie. Hello, nerds. Great <laughs> to be with you. I, I, I feel like right at home with the nerds since that was like my <laughs> identity in high school, pretty much yeah. actually for, for most of my life. Yeah, well, you know, I feel like nerd nerddom has has um has become more valued or more accepted yeah. now than you know growing up. Let's say. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's definitely cooler to be a nerd now. You know, it's funny. I have an eleven year old, and you know, he's like trying to be a jock, and I'm like, dude, <laughs> your your dad was never a jock. Uh, you know, your mom wasn't either. So it's like, don't you know, like embrace your nerddom, embrace who you are. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think also with popular culture, especially with um, all the like popular movies about missions to the moon and space travel and the importance of like really solving hard problems. Um, I kind of maybe I might be optimistic, but I kind of feel like it growing up being nerdy was like just doing well in school and kind of not being good at other things. But I think now being nerdy means like you're really good at things that are really important yeah, and impact a lot of people. At least uh, I mean, that's, that might be a biased opinion there. <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, I think a lot of it is about, you know, solving really tough problems. Right. Mm -hmm. And and we have, unfortunately, it's not like the tough problems have gone away. Right. It's not like, Oh, you solve one problem and you're done. So I think there's a certain element of that, like problem solver identity that's tied mm -hmm. up in nerddom. That's that's pretty cool. So, yeah. So Lonnie, for those who aren't familiar with you before your kind of uh, media appearances and stuff, tell us a little bit about your your kind of origin story. Where where did where does your story begin? Well, so my uh, my parents are from Taiwan. And mm -hmm. uh, they came to the U.S. in the 1970s, like a lot of immigrants from uh, from Asia, and mm -hmm. they. My dad's a doctor, so he came to the U.S. to finish his medical training, and my mom's a chemist, so she came to, to do graduate education, and they actually met in Ohio. They didn't know each other in, in Taiwan. They, they mm -hmm. came, and they, they both happened to be in Ohio, and, and the story, as legend tells it, they met at like a graduate student mixer, which is like, you talk about nerd, <laughs> talk about nerddom, it's like the ultimate nerddom, you know? So anyway, they, they meet at this graduate student mixer, and... Um, you know, they're like, oh, you're from Taiwan. You're from Taiwan. I let you know, mm -hmm. and like the the rest is history, right? So anyway, um, uh, yeah. So they they get married. Uh, I was born in North Carolina mm -hmm. uh, because my dad was uh, working on his you know further medical training. My mom was teaching chemistry, actually at Fort Bragg, and um, so I was born in North Carolina. I spent the first six years of my life in a town of 800 people. My dad was the town doctor, and we were the only you know Asian people for I mean. It was a, a very large radius. Um, and I remember it was kind of an idyllic, uh, you know, the first couple of years of my life, what I remember of it, like it was really nice. People were, were you know, super kind to us. And obviously mm. my dad was a town doctor, so everybody knew who he was. Mm. But, you know, after a couple of years, my parents figured out two things about North Carolina. One is very far from Taiwan, like very hard to get to, to home. And mm. I remember having to go through like Chicago and Minneapolis and San Francisco and Tokyo. And it would take like a day to get mm. to Taiwan whenever we try to visit family. And then the other thing is they observed the Chinese food was really bad in North Carolina at the time. I'm, I hear it's much better now, but anyway, mm -hmm. it was bad. So they moved to LA. Uh, they, we, so we moved to a suburb called Roland Heights, which some of your, um, some of the nerds on the, on the broadcast today may be familiar with, uh, kind of a, it's become an Asian enclave, but that's mm -hmm. where I grew up. I grew up in Southern California and I really, um, I loved growing up in SoCal. It was awesome. Um, you know, child of the nineties, 
uh, you know, wore clothes that were way too big for me. <laughs> um, I was yeah. really into Genera Hypercolor. I think that's that was the name of the company, right? Those shirts that would like change based on your oh, body. Oh wow! Heat, yeah, which yeah. at the time, which at the time seemed cool. Now, subsequently, I'm like, that's actually an awful idea because people can see exactly, <laughs> you know, how you're how you're feeling and, and what, how your body's <laughs> reacting to things. So anyway, I was um, uh, went to high school, went to public high school in Roland Heights. Um, you know, as I said, really had a great upbringing and then, and then was fortunate enough to get into Harvard. And that's where I spent, you know, substantially the, the next several years of my life. Uh, I actually ended up getting four degrees from Harvard, stayed for a long time. I got my, right. um, my undergrad in, in government, which is political science, uh, master's degree in political science, a, a law degree from Harvard law school, and then finally a PhD from, uh, in political science. And so, um, you know, I was there for a while, got to know the East coast very well, but, it's totally different from from growing up in LA. And I remember the first winter I was back there thinking, what have I done? Why would I ever, <laughs> why would I ever, ever come here? So anyway, so yeah, I, I you know, I sort of um, have a lot of SoCal in me still, even though we live in the Bay Area now and, and uh, we moved back here about nine years ago uh, to California, but I, um, I, I still love LA, you know, still have family down there. My wife's family's down there. My family's still down there. So it's, uh, um, you know, California's home. And uh, even though we spend a lot of time on the East Coast, there's still a lot of things about California that I'll always love and prefer. What did what was your dissertation on uh, for the PhD? So I wrote something called Essays on Elections. So it was kind of common at the time. Uh, it's still it still may be common. I haven't followed it. But in economics, at least, uh, you would write three essays and the essays would all be on a similar topic. But the common theme was that they were all individually publishable papers. So that trend actually uh, came into political science because political science, you know, a lot of people kind of joke around that political science is like the poor stepchild of economics because we, because we, methodologically, there's a lot of things in political science, at least when I was getting my PhD, that were very similar to what you mm -hmm. would be studying in economics. And the, I remember this really funny thing, which was, you know, I took, um, you know, calculus in high school and then I didn't take any math in college at all. Mm -hmm. And then I got to graduate school and I got this note from the department saying, hey, you have to do this remedial math <laughs> camp. And it was like six weeks of just awful, like every day, six hours of math. I'm like, what is this? I'm, I'm trying to get a PhD in political science. Why do I need to know math? But it, it became abundantly clear to me as I went on in my program. So this is a very long story. But my basic point is I wrote three papers all related to elections. And it was kind of fun because I got to study very different topics. So one of the papers looked at uh, the question of redistricting and how redistricting mm -hmm. uh, impacted Asian American uh, political participation. Uh, and then I did a paper on judicial elections, which I've always thought was a really weird concept that you would elect judges. Mm. But the question I was really interested in asking was, did the form of judicial election impact uh, substantive legal outcomes? So what do I mean by that? In some states like Texas, for example, judges are elected based on partisan labels. Like there's Republican judges and Democrat mm, judges, which mm -hmm. is like even weirder to me. In other states, you have nonpartisan elections. And so judges stand for election. And you don't know what party they're from. Um, and I was curious, like, does that impact the likelihood that a criminal conviction gets overturned? And as it turns out, it does. There's actually an impact that partisan judges are more likely to um, to uphold criminal convictions because they want to look tough. So when they go before mm. the voters, they they look tough, I guess. So there was that. And then the third paper I did was on presidential elections and looking at, you know, where people um, uh, go within swing states, where presidential candidates visit within swing states when they're visiting places like Nevada or Pennsylvania. Uh -huh. How do they pick where they go? So Anyway, those were kind of three separate papers, but they all loosely were tied to elections. So my dissertation was called Essays on Elections. Wow. that yeah. They all still sound very relevant and interesting. Um, yeah. Know. Yeah. What I did mean, you do I after? Like, it seems like um, the perfect uh, resume and background to then start working on some campaigns. And yeah. is that what you did or what did well, you do I, after? I, I had like... Uh, a really tough time deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And so the only reason I went back and got my PhD is I thought, well, at some point, maybe I'll want to teach. Mm -hmm. And I had this great undergraduate thesis advisor, a guy named Sid Verba, who's kind of a legend in, in political science circles. He was at Harvard for decades. And um, he said, oh, I, I think it'd be, you know, I think you'd be pretty good at it. So I, I went and did it, but 
it was so difficult for me because when I first got there, it really wasn't I ex- what wasn't what I expected. You know, the whole math camp thing I, mm-hmm. I told you about. So <laughs> I actually, um, when I was in graduate school and even when I was in law school, I would bounce back and forth between um, working in Washington, which is really what I wanted to do. After I graduated from college with my undergraduate degree, I moved to DC. And I didn't have a job, you know, I sort of moved down there thinking, well, I'll just get a job. And my parents were like, what are you doing? Like, go, mm-hmm. go do something with your life, you know, what, because you have all this education now and, and you should go and, and like have a career. And I was like, no, no, I want to go to DC. And they're like, well, what do you do in DC? So I moved down there without a job. And then I, I, I took a job with like a PR firm after like four or five months, I finally got a job when I was in DC. And I, I really didn't like it very much. And I was like, this is not what I expected. So that's why I went back to graduate school. But then when I was in graduate school, as I was saying earlier, I was not all that excited about that either. So mm-hmm. I spent some time in DC during my time in graduate school. Uh, and my initial um, jump into kind of politics, this whole realm was actually on the public policy side. I was really interested in healthcare policy because as I said, my dad's a doctor. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up doing a fellowship at a think tank called the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative Mm -hmm. oriented think tank in in DC. And I studied healthcare policy and did some more healthcare work. And eventually I did start working on campaigns actually. One summer, uh, my first summer of law school, uh, I worked for the George W. Bush reelection campaign. And I did that because I got to meet people when I was in Washington and meet people through my fellowship. And I often say to so a lot of people, you know, it's not like my parents had any political background at all, right? They came from Taiwan. They were scientifically uh, oriented. And so I had to kind of build my own network. And and so that was a really hard thing there for a couple of years, just meeting people and saying like, hey, I'm interested in doing this. Do you have any advice? And and so eventually I, I worked on that presidential campaign, which was great. That was in, in 04. Uh, and then while I was in school, I was kind of toggling back and forth constantly between politics and and school. And then finally, uh, after I finished my law degree, uh, that's when I met Mitt Romney. And I know, uh, mm-hmm. you know, some people may be interested about my background with him. So anyway, I met him and uh, started to work with him and he decided he wanted to run for president. And so I did another presidential campaign and from there it kind of just took off. So I've always had this this sort of one foot in in academics, one mm. foot in politics, policy, the real world. And and I really enjoyed that because I had a little bit of, uh, I guess, kind of like ADD. I, I really couldn't sit still and I really couldn't just do one thing. So I was kind of all over the place. Was that you must have been one of the few Asian Americans in these presidential campaigns? What was what was that like? Was that a thing was, or did yeah, you notice I mean, it? I absolutely notice it. I mean, you walk yeah. around, you don't see any other people <laughs> who look like you, you know, and I remember I remember Gosh, I vividly remember this one time, actually on that on that first campaign in 04, where I mean, I, I'm not even kidding you. I was walking around the hallway and I had my you know campaign worker badge on, mm-hmm. feeling very official. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm working on healthcare policy for the president of the United States. This is great. This guy goes, Hey, um, my computer's busted. Are you, yeah, are, <laughs> can can you help out? It's like, and I remember thinking to myself, like, I was so shocked. I was like, but I shouldn't have been, right? I guess I shouldn't right. have been because it wasn't like there were a ton of Asian dudes roaming around the hallway of of uh, presidential campaign headquarters mm-hmm. so i was sort of like i guess i can help you and right. so i i think i made it worse i walked over <laughs> and i was like i i like i i, I was like pretending i was kind of knowing yeah, i was an intern you know it was sort of like intern volunteers so i was like pretending to to know what i was doing and um i i, I brought up the blue screen of death for him and oh, i'm like boy. I was like, oh, sorry, man, I can't, I can't help you. You got to reinstall with us. <laughs> I walked away. So anyway, yeah, that, that actually happened. Do you think uh, he would have asked you if you appeared, if you were of a different background? Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. Interesting. I mean, you know, and, and, and um, it, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I have come up through, through the ranks and, you know, sort of just had to, had to deal with being the only, you know, Asian guy mm-hmm. in a lot of these settings or Asian gal for that matter. Right. And, mm-hmm. uh, um, it, it was especially acute to me when I had to start managing people. And as I rose in these political organizations and, and, you know, in 2012, I ran all of policy for Romney. I was his policy director when he ran for mm-hmm. president. So we had a, you know, 80 person operation at headquarters, and we probably had a couple thousand people who were helping out on the outside. And, and, you know, by then it was sort of like you were in a position of authority. So no one was going to mess with you mm-hmm. at that point. Right. But it was noticeable to me how few Asian Americans there were in, in that context, in that setting. And so, um, you know, I've always made it a point. It's something that's always been very important to me to mentor 
and to try and bring along. Cause now I talked to lots of Asian American, you know, kids in high school, kids in mm -hmm. college, recent grads who, who want to get involved. And I'm like, that's great. You know? And they're like, but I'm, but I maybe, you know, my political views are different from you. It's like, I don't care. I, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter. You know, I mean, we're all going to have our own views and I, I believe in my views and, and I have a reason for that. But at the end of the day, I think we all do better when we have people who, you know, understand our life experiences involved in the political system. And that's that's what this is all about, in my view. So uh, I'm glad to see more and more people who look like me. I, and I hope that people will get to a point where the, the experiences I had weren't aren't aren't going to be the experiences that folks mm -hmm. have in you know five or 10 years. Were, was it ever awkward when you were in these policy discussions when um, issues around China came up, China policy? I mean, obviously, your parents are from Taiwan, so you yeah. could argue like that's the most uh, kind of strongest counterbalance to a China bias. But that's yeah. a nuanced kind of uh, perspective that maybe others may not have. Did you ever feel like, oh, I better be really tough on China <laughs> just to make it super um, clear? Yeah, no, I, I never felt pressure to be extra tough. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I I do have a view that where the you know Chinese Communist Party is now is a is is a problem, and I mm -hmm. think that that um, there was a period of time in my life when the likelihood of cooperation between China and the U.S. was much higher because of stuff both governments were doing. I don't think we're in that phase now. Mm -hmm. I, I never felt pressure to be extra tough. I'll just say that I was always very aware when those issues would come up that. It, it did feel like when those issues would come up in conversations, people would be extra sensitive around mm -hmm. it. Actually. They would be like more like, okay, well, you know, we don't <laughs> the Asian American perspective. And it's like, listen, <laughs> this is a foreign policy issue. Like, you know, just like we handle Russia or Afghanistan mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, any other issue, Central America. Right. And, and on the course of that presidential campaign, we did, we talked about issues across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I felt like people were almost more sensitive toward me than I was, I was just like, listen, this is what I think. Right. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I think that the issue is super complicated and it is tied up with issues of acceptance for the Chinese and Taiwanese American communities here in the U S. And I think that the over the top kind of, um, vitriol that's mm -hmm. been expressed toward China. I mean, that is, it's a problem. It's a deeply prob problematic thing. And I wish I could say you can completely separate out the policy from the rhetoric, but they've become so tied together that, you know, e even I find it's tough sometimes in these conversations where I have to be very mindful of the fact that we're in a very, very charged time in the relationship right now. And that has implications for people of Chinese and Taiwanese descent here in the U.S. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, well, look, we could spend a lot of time talking about those Romney days. Um, maybe one last question, then we'll switch to California. I actually think Romney took some heat at the time for saying that Russia would be a problem <laughs> for the world. Yeah. And, um, you know, it turns out he might have been right. And I'm yeah. wondering, like, do you do you catch up with old colleagues and be like, look, all the time, they finally got it <laughs> all the all, all the time. And I can't tell you how many like revisionist media things I've read. It's like, oh, Romney was right. And it's like at the time, it's like you're a complete a holder to, to Romney, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's cool now, you know, and it's like, no, I mean, you know, Mitt Romney is a really smart dude, obviously. Right. Mm -hmm. And and that's one of the things that's one of the reasons why I felt like we we kind of got along from a very early point. And, and he I got to say, I mean, he remains a, a, a mentor and someone who I respect a lot. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a lot. And um, I know a lot of there's a lot of opinions about him in politics and we don't have to talk about those. I just talk about him, the person. And I will say, like. That guy throughout his career has always seen merit in people. And he's never seen color of your skin, what you look like, if you're a man or a woman, like he is just about picking the best talent. And he didn't have to pick a 34 year old Asian kid to be his policy director. Right. But mm -hmm. he did because he's like, Hey, you can do the job and I trust you and I trust your, your counsel. And, um, for me, I can't tell you how important that's been in my own life. Like just giving yourself the confidence, like, Hey, you know what? I can hang with any of these guys. Right. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, the Russia thing. I remember having these long conversations about it. And, and I was thinking to myself, like, really, Russia? Like, are you <laughs> sure about this? But he just he knew because of his time in business, having dealt with um, Russian companies and from his study of foreign policy, he just knew that there was something about Vladimir Putin that was deeply problematic to the 
to the liberal small mm -hmm. L world world order. And it turns out he was absolutely right. And he's been validated in his view and, you know, good for him. I wish more yeah. people had listened to him at the time. Yeah. I mean, I, I often wonder like, Ooh, if he had run just four years later, like it's, it's just hard to go it's out. Hard. It's hard to take. I, Obama was just kind of a once in a long time kind of, was a generational athlete. leader. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Generational athletes, the way to describe me, really yeah. like exceptional political athlete. I mean, I politics, uh, you know, Tom, like I've learned this so much of politics is timing. Mm. It really is. And it's totally out of your control. And you can be like the most exquisite candidate and have all the right boxes checked and you still lose because yeah. you ran in a bad environment, you know, and I don't care what party you are. If you know, it's like in 2018, if you were a Republican, you were going to lose. Yeah. In 2010, if you were a Democrat, you were going to lose. Like, mm -hmm. that's just how it is, right? And 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 the environment matters so much in politics and so much about its timing and and uh, fortuity and and uh, and outside of your control. You know. So when was the first time that you put your own name on on a ballot? Uh, last year. I mean, this is this is my this is my first this is my <laughs> first time doing it, and you know, it's like. Um, for so many years, I'd advise people and I've right. been involved in politics and I've seen so many campaigns. I've been a part of so many campaign decisions. And then you put your own name on the ballot and you go through the process and you realize like there's things that are really different about it, you know, and, and the expectations are different. And when you're the candidate, you're the one who's, you know, it's you, you call, you call the, t you have to make the tough decisions. And, and I remember like in campaigns, you would be like, oh, this is a really tough decision. Here are the, here are the ways you can go. Mm -hmm. Thank God I don't have to make that decision. <laughs> you know, and, and now it's like, no, 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 actually, you, you've got to, you've got to make decisions about, about your campaign and what you want to do and, and how you want to portray what you want to do to everybody mm -hmm. else out there and very different experience. But um, it, it, the awesome part of it is that through, through no other way, would you be able to meet so many different people from so many different walks of life and to get all over California, which is a massive state. And just talk to people like, hey, what's going on in your life? What what concerns you? What what can I do to make it better? What can I do to try to make it better? And to actually run for a job where I feel like, hey, I can actually have an impact. I could make it mm -hmm. better. That part is awesome. And and I, I wouldn't trade that part for anything. But there's just parts about running for office that are that are a grind, as I'm sure when you've talked to other people who are involved in politics, they'll tell you the same thing. Like it's there are parts of it that are a grind for sure. What was the decision making process to run? I mean, you had had a great track record of working on very, you know, monumental campaigns and, you know, teaching and research and all this kind of stuff, um, you know, anal as an analyst on in in on new shows, what was the moment or motivation for you to say, you know, I need to, I need to, I need to run now. I, I want, I want to be the principal. Yeah. I mean, I would say over the last couple of years, there's a couple of things that have come together, right? Because I've been um, I've been at Stanford and the Hoover Institution. I've been teaching and writing, and, and that's been my base of operations. And I've I've loved it. I've loved the chance to teach and and to comment on on issues and you know be on Meet the Press and do fun stuff like that. But what you realize is that the impact you have on kind of what happens in the public square is still limited. And mm -hmm. if you really feel as I do that there are things about your state or your city or your country that are headed in the wrong direction and you want to fix them. You really, there is a, a difference between being a commentator and an outsider and actually being in the arena and actually being in a position to fix the problem. And I remember talking to, um, you know, Condi Rice is the director of the Hoover Institution now. And I've been fortunate to, to have a few conversations with her about, you know, just kind of what we're doing and, and mm -hmm. my, my personal interest. And she made the same point. She's like, listen, if you really want to have impact, um, you, you, you're going to have to really jump in even more than, than you are now. And not everyone will make the decision to run for office, but I felt like particularly for California, I was really frustrated by a lack of accountability for, you know, we, we, we sent a lot of tax dollars to Sacramento and we've made policy decisions about about that. And, you know, it is what it is, but I felt like, you know, it doesn't feel like we're getting a great return on our investment. It doesn't feel like we're getting a great return on all this money we're sending. Why is that? And the more I dug into it, the more I realized it's because nobody actually ever blows the whistle. Nobody ever says like, Hey, uh, are you doing this the right way? Does that make sense? And so I, I started to really set out and think what, where could I have an impact and what positions could actually make a difference on this? And, and that's kind of why I decided to run for controller, which is not a job that people think about a lot. But it, it is a job where I feel like you can move the needle on, on accountability and making things better. So, you know, really for me, it was frustration with the status quo and deciding, you know what, I have a skill set and an experience base 
where I feel like I could make a difference if I jumped in and try to do things this way and actually try to take my experience and, and use it, you know, in the elective sphere. And, um, you know, I, I hope it works out, but I also know that, um, part of my running is to encourage other people who might think the same way to step forward and do the same. Cause we need more good people to do it. If you look at the political system now, unfortunately, I think a lot of people who run aren't, aren't motivated and fueled by, by the right things. And, um, not to make it like a normative thing, but I do think like, if you get in, you should want to help people and advance a certain mission. And, you know, I, I don't know if there's enough of that now. So you're an interesting, uh, candidate in that you are running for a, an office that isn't the first thing people think of when they're like, Oh, elections are coming in November. <laughs> Who am I going to pick for controller? Right. 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 On the other hand, it's a really important role. It reminds me of certain roles in corporations where they're not at the, you know, always at the podium for the big announcements. But if you need to make any big decision, like that person's in the room kind of thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and they actually know like kind of where all the bodies are, where buried. the bodies are buried. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So tell me a little bit about your views on, on the controller role for the state of California and like, what, what, what do you think success looks like if you were doing that role? So California, you know, has eight uh, statewide elected officials who are all independent. They don't uh, report to each other. They don't report to the governor. And so, you know, people will know the governor and the attorney general mm -hmm. and the secretary of state who administers elections. We, we have two roles in California that are devoted to fiscal, the fiscal well-being of our state. One is controller, the other is treasurer. And the way to think about it is the treasurer deals with all the money coming in. The controller deals with all the money going out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the controller role uh, was set up in our constitution here in California and the laws of our state to be somebody who would be a watchdog, basically somebody who would, because you're dealing with all the money going out mm -hmm. to have some accountability for where all the money was going and what it was being spent on. And so it's a watchdog role. It's a role that I believe independence is really important in, right? Having some measure of independence from other statewide elected officials, being politically independent, being substantively somewhat independent, being able to dispassionately look at what's happening. And, and the controller was also kind of gifted with two other sets of, of um, powers that are really important. One is the audit power. You have the ability to audit any state or, or local agency that uses state money at any time for any reason, you can go in there and say, Hey, open your book, show me what's going on. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of interesting. And then they put the controller on 80 different boards and commissions across the state, including the boards that govern our big state pension programs called CalPERS and CalSTRS, um, the state lands commission, which actually has a huge role to play in questions involving energy development in our state. Um, down to boards that look at the allocation of capital for um, nonprofit healthcare institutions that look to build new facilities, right? So th th there are some more, you know, sort of substantive elements of it and some more, you might consider clerical elements of it. But at the end of the day, it is a, it is a hugely important role for effective management of state resources. And when you have a state that spends $300 billion a year, mm. I should hope that you have somebody who's saying, Hey, are we, is that money being spent the right way? Like, are we sure that that money needs to go there? Or, you know, what's been the effect of that money? Because one of the things that drives me nuts about government it always has is that it spends all this money, whether federal, state, or local, and nobody ever stops to say, Hey, did that, did that spending matter? Mm -hmm. Was it effective in, in a corporate setting? You, you know, it, you would obviously you'd measure ROI. There's no question you'd have to, if you didn't, you would be, you'd be foolish and, you know, you would be out of, out of a job in politics. It's like business as usual. There's never any effort in our political system. It seems to me to assess efficacy and we have to be smarter about how we spend money because the problems are too big. There are too many people hurting for us not to be like, Hey, you need to homelessness is a great example. You spend all this money. What are you actually doing with the money? Are you helping mm -hmm. fewer people become homeless? And the answer is quite obvious if you live in California, it's no. So how are folks on the on the trail resonating with with this type of uh, perspective? Because from from my ears, it's like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. You know, you're going to want to test and learn and optimize. And this is how you deploy resources in a normal uh, like in a for profit environment. Yeah. Um, in the political environment, it seems like people are more focused on the hot kind of hot button issues of the oh, day, yeah. you know, and yes, we need to spend more on climate. We need to spend more on homelessness and education. 
but rarely do we say, oh, well, what's been working and what's the what's the sort of return on investment and how do we make sure that it's really going to do what we think it's going to do? You know, when I when I get people's attention and I talk to them about it, it people are very interested and, mm -hmm. and and they engage a lot with what I'm saying. It's just getting getting people interested. That's hard, you know, and um, pe people invariably when I talk about controller and talk about things I want to do, they always have their issue that they are curious about. Right. So one of the things I've had to, to do is really figure out what could I do as controller that would impact issues people care about. And, mm -hmm. and I and I want to be careful because. I'm not one of these guys that's going to say like, oh yeah, I can solve all your problems. It's like, no, the controller can't solve all your problems. Okay. Like, and what drives me nuts are these politicians that go out there and say, oh, I'm going to, you know, we're going to, we're going to go to Mars in 2020, you know, 2025, because I'm elected dog catcher. It's like, no, like, don't, don't mess with people that way. Be real with them. Right. And so when people ask me the question, I always say, okay, listen, my my role in this universe is in the accountability accountability transparency realm. So I had a guy the other day ask me, "Hey, you know what? Gas prices are really high. Can you get the gas prices down?" And it's like, <laughs> um, last I checked, the controller does not have control over the global market for oil, so probably not. But here's what I can do: I can tell you that in California, we pay higher gas taxes than in any other state, and the reason that we do that is because we constantly seem to believe that there are areas that we can increase taxation in, and there's really probably not going to be a, a, a cost. What I can do is to say, where's that gas tax money going? Okay. And is it actually solving the problems? And then we hand it over to you, the people and the policymakers to say, do you believe this is the right course? If we find that we're, we're taxing the gas, uh, the consumption of gas at this level, but we're not getting this return. Do you all believe this is the best way to continue proceeding? As controller, I can't change mm -hmm. gas tax amount. I can't say, I can't decree tomorrow it's going to be 50 cents instead of 56 cents. But I can start a conversation about why those taxes are what they are if we're not getting the results people say we're getting. And I think that's an important thing for people to understand. And, and so people sort of nod and they say, oh, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it would be nice to have more information. And it would be nice for me when I'm having a conversation with my policymaker, my legislator, the governor, whoever has power over this to say, you know what I, you know what the controller found out actually is that you're not using that money very effectively. So why do you need all that money? Or does, can yeah. you put in place more controls to make sure it goes to the place it's supposed to go to? Does it, who does the controller report to? Do they report to the, the governor? people? The oh, people. Okay. The controller is completely independent. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so the controller actually can call the governor's bluff. Oh. And 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 you can go back and forth, and that's why you know actually the position is kind of genius. And when the when the found when the founders when the constitutional crafters of our of our state mm -hmm. constitution made the decision they were going to have a controller, is actually like oh it actually makes sense. You need somebody who's independent to sit, to stop and say, are you sure about that? Yeah, does that make sense? And and by the way, not empowered to stop things from happening necessarily, but empowered to provide again good governance information transparency mm -hmm. that's really it's it's a good government office at core yeah i and i feel like at the federal level do we, we have the gao but i don't know if we have the, the equivalent like i don't i don't even know who the head of the equivalent yeah of the federal level i mean is. gao provides oversight and they write reports that nobody reads right uh, they're actually really good reports uh if you if you ever dig in um, yeah but but there 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 are you know there are like inspectors general in mm -hmm. in various departments but that's more for like true malfeasance like someone's committing mm -hmm. fraud mm -hmm. um but but the structure is is different i i i can't point oh. one i mean there are a lot of oversight now actually at the federal level what congress does congress doesn't legislate particularly well what they do do decently well is oversight because mm. everyone likes to hear their own voice and oversight right. is really at the end of the day what you know kind of politically motivated oversight is um it's interesting how many legislators in California I've talked to, Democrat and Republican, who universally say we don't do enough oversight in California. Mm. We don't have enough legislative oversight because they actually have tons and tons of legislation that they consider. And, and some would argue the volume of that legislation interferes with their ability to conduct effective oversight. And so that's one of the things the controller is useful for in, in the state of California and other states that have a similar concept which is it gives you an independent oversight officer who can go in and, and examine these things the legislature and the governor are doing. So is there like a annual report from the California controller saying, hey, these were 
here's your pie chart of where the money went and here's the dashboard of the you know the key performance indicators for these programs or something like that i i i I wish there were so there is something we produce called the annual annual consolidated financial report which is Mm -hmm. a it's supposed to emulate a balance sheet only Mm -hmm. the thing i like to say is it's a balance sheet where you don't know the full extent of liabilities and assets Mm -hmm. (laughs) so it's a little weird right because they call it a balance sheet but it's not really a balance sheet so one of the things i'd love to do by this a different project is really is really enable people to fully understand what is the full scope of our state's assets and liabilities but putting Mm -hmm. that aside for a moment there isn't an easy to understand way in, in my view of people getting information about how the state is using our resources and one of the things that really frankly um upsets me is that california is the only state where we don't have complete line by line transparency into state spending Mm -hmm. in other words you cannot go and find the state checkbook anywhere every other state has that capacity california doesn't and it's a function of how we've done things historically I hear there are some technological challenges, which I think is kind of bogus because I've talked to a lot of people who are like, yeah, I think the technology is there. If you really wanted to to pull all this together, you could. Mm -hmm. So that would be one of the projects that I would consider like a great legacy project where I'd, where I'd be able to win and do this is to be able to create finally a fully transparent portal where people can go and say, how exactly has the state spent money? Uh, How exactly has the state spent my money line by line? Just show me. And if we could have that, I think that'd be a huge step forward, to be honest with you. But we, we and, and even when you have that data, the question of how you present it so people understand mm-hmm. is another issue. And I'm a big believer, leader, uh, big believer in kind of, um, uh, you know, infographics and, and ways of helping people understand data and mm-hmm. consume data. And I would love to bring some of those tools to to the office, you know, and and one of the things we've kind of messed around with a little bit on my campaign is just making videos explaining to people like different elements of the state budget or different elements of what the state spends money on, just so they understand like, hey, here's where your money's going, because I don't think there's nearly enough public education around those things. And part of it's because people are are generally probably they don't care, or maybe they're a little bit apathetic, but they should care. It's their money. Yeah. And, you know, if the stuff's not working right and problems aren't being solved, like, I think we deserve to know why. Yeah, well, if you guys put together any infographics or data visualization or charts of any sort where you want to come back in the future and we'll talk about it together, like you will have a a very interested audience here. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, that'd be fun. I mean, I think I think, you know, people would love to dig in on homelessness. Right. And that's Mm. a big problem in California. Yeah. And um, I've tried really hard and I've talked to people who are advocates in the space about, hey, how can we get more data on where the money's actually going and seeing whether it's solving problems? And and the answer I get over and over again is good luck. Like it it gets distributed so many different ways and it ends up in so many different nonprofits and all this other stuff. Like you can't figure it out. And it's like, well, that's kind of weird. Don't you think like that's our, it's our money at the end of the day. Should Mm -hmm. we kind of know where it goes and then be able to assess the efficacy of programs? Like one of the things I think we should do is every state program should have a letter grade that basically says how Mm -hmm. efficient and effective has it been. And you show people what the basis for that grade is. You're not just like making it up like, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like, like some college TAs did where they're like, oh, this feels like a C to me. (laughs) No, like actually have data and say, Mm -hmm. these are, these are the benchmarks that we had tried to reach with this program. Here's what actually happened. And here's the, here's the letter grade, right? Here's the efficacy of it. So that's, that's part of the plan. That's all part of my plan in terms of the, the broader transparency I want to bring to what's happening in California. I know we only have a few minutes left. I have a couple of questions in the chat. Um, DW wants to know about what distinguishes you from the other candidate that is uh, on the ballot. for this. Yeah. So we had an open primary in June, which is, you know, Mm -hmm. everybody from all parties compete against each other. And, uh, you know, I came out of it along with one other person. Uh, And, you know, look, I think that at the end of the day, I believe I'm going to be fully focused on the challenges we've talked about, transparency, accountability. And I think I've got the right experience and background in politics, but also in the private sector. And one of the things we haven't talked about is I've spent the last couple of years as an investor as well, Mm -hmm. working on kind of healthcare technologies. I've been the chairman of a, of a healthcare system here in Northern California. Healthcare is an issue I care about deeply. Um, I think having some of that background, private sector in academics, um, as well as in policymaking, I think that range of experiences is, is important. And I think that I'm the only person that brings that range of experience to the job, but also a focus, you know, I'm not, um, I'm not really, uh, 
interested in satisfying other people politically. Like I don't really care about whether people are happy with me or not. At the end of the day, my job is to be a watchdog. And I think because uh, I come from a different partisan background than the party in power in California, I have a measure of independence from the party in power that's needed in this job. And that's why, you know, you even have the LA Times endorsing me. The LA Times hasn't endorsed a, a Republican in a really long time, you know? And so um, I, I think I can bring that kind of clarity to um, to what's going on and an independence that's really needed. I love it, Lonnie. It was great having you in the nerd zone. I know we, you've got a drop in a minute. Um, really appreciate you coming on, sharing a little bit more about yourself and uh, the role and the approach you'd bring to it. And I hope we can get you back on it. It was the time. Hey, anytime, lie. man, this yeah. is, this is fun. I mean, I'm, this is, this is my crowd, right? I mean, the, uh, <laughs> we, as, as we, as we said earlier, you know, the, the, the nerd never really leaves you. So I appreciate the time, Tom, and, and thanks for doing this. Love it. Well, enjoy the rest of your weekend. And with that, Thank we'll you. say goodbye nerds. Goodbye nerds. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So that was Lonnie Chen. What an interesting dude. Uh, Republican, former Romney guy, appointed by Obama. We didn't get a chance to talk about how he was appointed by Obama to serve on the Social Security Commission, uh, Reform Commission. And, uh, you know, if you're a Republican in California, a controller is probably a really uh, smart role to go for. And I think it kind of, at least Lonnie's positioning it as, hey, you kind of want uh, an independent counterbalance or, you know, just trust but verify a uh, guy in this role or gal in this role who's going to bring the data. So interesting. Check out uh, Lonnie on uh, on his website. Oh, I forgot. I should ask him to list himself on uh, OTP on other people. Um, but we'll I'll talk to him about that after. Um, yes, yeah, soldier one, it's nice to see seeing people running for office and Jeremy, I, I wanted to get to your question about way well, how come California doesn't have more oversight. Um, but we ran out of time cause Lonnie had a hard stop at nine 45 Pacific. Um, it's interesting that we don't have a, a lot of oversight, but it sounds like if he were elected, he would bring some more, um, before we wrap up, I did want to share some uh, exciting news. We just wrapped up a competition on Of the People, and I wanted to shout out who the winners were. So again, Of the People is like kind of like Yelp for uh, political candidates. And it's uh, we said, hey, by Friday, which was yesterday, whoever has the most approval votes and is trending, the top three are going to get a hundy from uh, yours truly. So I just donated a hundred bucks to these three uh, talented candidates based on some of your uh, who who participated uh, approval votes. So by the way, if you ever want to vote, you just click on the person's uh, profile. You click on this blue approve button and sign in, and we register your vote, and then we order. Uh, by the most uh, most approval votes recently. There's an all-time as well. Uh, Larry actually got his number one all-time, but for the in terms of uh, recent approval votes, we got David Kim, John Fetterman, and Jermaine Johnson uh, winning. So they uh, they deserve great support from you. A lot of people approve them. I just. Uh, donated a hundred bucks each to, to them and uh, appreciate all the people who donate to of the people.us. We have a lot of Patreon supporters that cover our um, web hosting fees, our software licensing fees. And we're, we have some volunteer engineers who are working on the next set of new features to of the people.us. The biggest one is going to be an ask me anything um capability that's uh you know kind of about halfway through being built right now so that any candidate can receive questions post answers and then have it visible to everybody else and have that as part of their otp profile and that's be another way for you to get to know candidates if you you know need more information about them uh, i should also do a shout out to our amazing channel members 
who make um, Nerds for Humanity possible. A lot of people uh, have asked me, like, wow, you're still doing that Nerds for Humanity show. And I'm like, well, you know, I have some members. And if they're going to kind of whip out a few bucks uh, every month to support the pr content costs, then, uh, you know, I'll, I'll keep going. So let me just call out uh, our top members. So this is in order of uh, uh, amount of support and length of support. So we're going to start with our biggest supporter, our uh, vice president. Uh, sorry, uh, senior vice president. That would be Soldier One, who I think, oh, wait a minute. Soldier One is in the... <laughs> soldier one is in the uh in the chat room right now so uh <laughs> yes yeah, shout out to you uh, as well Vaughn. you're gonna get there too and soldier one thank you sir for uh for doing everything you do for this channel and then we have and if you are not a member and you're on watching on youtube just uh click on the join link and then you can start for as little as like a couple dollars a month it, it, it helps uh, and then the VP level, we have Kristen Slevin and Bike Bike. So thank you to Kristen and Bike Bike. Kristen's been a supporter for 31 months. Jeez. Thank you, Kristen. And then at the hardcore level, we have Gene, David, DK, Jekalego, Kirsch, Mr. History, Mona, Vaughn, Yang, Robert, Dean. Statnerd, Galessa, J. Perrin, A. H., Dana, Jason, Parth, and Daniel. And uh, this live stream is also uh, subsidized by StreamYard. So thank you to StreamYard for giving us a complimentary live streaming service. So we really appreciate that. And then at the verified level, uh, which is our entry level, but still very important, uh, starting with our oldest members, our o OG members, you got Lisa, Albert, Brandon, Arez, Sophia, Doris, Emerald, Ben, Rasta, James, Emma, Huey, Elizabeth, Ira, Shoni, Jameson, Dr. William, Karen, Arden, Zemery, Mai, Brittany, Warren, Juana, Lucky, Kevin, Nell, Nija, and Jeremy, and our newest overall nerds based on who joined most recently. We have Jeremy Sammons, Nija, Toby the Nija player, and Daniel Battelle. And our oldest nerds are Lisa, Jean, Kristen, Albert, Brandon, Arez, and David. So thank you to all of you guys for making that happen. Um, if you are uh, still watching this live, and you haven't yet, and you're like, hey, I like Nerds for Humanity. I don't have a spare change to become a member. The next best thing you can do is uh, like, share, and drop a comment so that the all-powerful algorithms know that this content is engaging and of interest to you as an audience. Um, and let me also thank the people who are supporting um, of the people, the Patreon supporters, and those, if you want to be a Patreon supporter for Of The People, just go to ofthepeople.us and then click on Accelerate This Project. And our biggest supporters in order of magnitude are Eric Sanchez, Tohir T, Elizabeth O, Tony P, Rockout, Iggy C, Aaron S, John P, Rob, Timothy J, Jessica G, Trickle Up, Muhan Z, Travis C, Austin B, Mai Z, and Dylan J. And I think there's a little bit of overlap between Nerds for Humanity and of the people, which is always cool. Um, last thing I'm going to do is share a little bit of... Ah, thank you, Toby. Or Tubi. I think it's Toby. Uh, for rehooking up your credit card. Appreciate that. Um, Let's see. And uh, hey, Jay Perrin, he's old school. He's been he's been with the nerd show for a long time. 
All right, uh, let's just take a look at what's what I've been tweeting about because I often tweet about politics, as you know. So if you haven't followed me on Twitter, it's uh, at Nerds for Yang, uh, but you can search for Tom at, uh, from Nerds for Humanity. Okay, let's just quickly scroll through. And then I'm thinking of doing a live stream reacting to the Andrew Yang interview on CNN by Acosta. I know there were a lot of people who felt it was an unfair interview. A lot of people felt that Andrew was unprepared. I'm not sure. I mean, it's it's kind of old news that happened last week. If that's something you all would be interested in, um, just let me know in the comments below if you want to see the nerd reacts to Andrew Yang interview on CNN. Um, let's see. I tweeted about, uh, well, we're currently live streaming on Twitter and YouTube and Facebook. Uh, and this will be available on audio podcast. So if you listen to audio podcast, subscribe, just search for nerds for humanity. We announced our winners for the OTP contest. I provided evidence that I did follow through on, uh, on my commitment to donating a hundred bucks to the top three, which were in order, David Kim, John Fetterman and Jermaine Johnson. Fetterman's an interesting guy. Kind of proud that he uh, or his campaign listed him on OTP very early. Uh, and he might be, um, you know, a real candidate for um, Senate uh, over um, the Trump candidate, Oz, uh, the Oprah show uh, commentator. So um, there's a David Kim stuff. Oh, yesterday I interviewed uh, Mark Berman, who's a state assembly member. So we talked about some state legislation coming up around education and climate. And uh, um, what else did we talk about? Climate, education. Oh, election reform. So that was cool. Uh, then I, so I can't help it. I can't help but calling BS on some of the, the craziness. Um, you know, I said, Hey, you know, remember when the MAGA people were saying gas would be $10 a gallon because of this radical socialist Harris Biden agenda. And, you know, we've had prices come down for the last two months. They're still high. No doubt. They're still high, but you know, the president doesn't control they don't he doesn't have a dial in the oval office to say oh should you pay four dollars a gallon or, or two dollars a gallon um it's influence it's a global market and and america is not the only country that buys uh fuel uh, and needs to access that market so it's a global commodity market and you know when you have a war uh by russia that produces a lot of fuel and the rest of the market says, hey, we don't want to buy from them. And then you have OPEC that decides it doesn't want to produce a lot more. And then you have demand spiking because people are traveling and they're they're feeling like, hey, you know, we're over the hump on the COVID stuff. Although we're we're not. I mean, I'm still I just got it a few weeks ago. It sucked. Totally sucked. Is anybody who says COVID is a sniffles is just does not know what BA5 looks like um, and has not looked at the data. But either way, I was just saying like, look, remember when you hear OAN and Fox and True Social talk about how Biden is such a disaster and he's caused gas prices to go up, like they don't talk about gas prices anymore. Now they're talking about like stealing your pronouns or some, I don't know what the hell they're talking about these days, but um so anyway, I, I was, I was, I feel like from time to time, I got to call BS on the, the kind of ultra radical MAGA like narrative people. And, and, you know, it's, it's impressive how coordinated they are, um, what they talk about, but it's also BS when they just make things up. Um, then, yeah, then I talked about the, uh, the Mar-a-Lago search warrant and i was saying hey you know this this guy this orange dude keeps popping off about how he wants to release the affidavit completely 
but his own lawyers this week in court chose to take a um, uh, observer status and did not formally request that the affidavit be uh, released and uh, unredacted. And I think it's one of those things where it's like Trump talking about his tax records, oh, I want to release them, or remember when we were supposed to get the official Trump health care plan in like 2016? I think we're still waiting for that. Um, but he likes to talk about it, and he assumes that people won't hold him accountable for following through. Uh, so in my small way, I'm like, hey, look, you want a, you want transparency? You want that affidavit released? Then you should legally request that it be released as well. Don't just uh, tell your lawyers to kind of keep a, keep their mouth shut about it and then go on True Social and talk about how you're a big, big fan of transparency. Um, yeah, this was just a random one. I was just like sitting at a traffic stop. I'm like, it's red. There's literally no other cars coming from either direction. And, you know, we have cars that can drive themselves. Would it be that hard to put a little lens with each traffic light and say, hey, if I'm red and I'm giving the other lane green, but I don't see any cars in the other lane forever, then flip it. Make the other one red because no one's going to be affected and make this other one green because there's like 10 cars waiting. Um, it just doesn't seem like rocket science. So maybe, hopefully some of our new infrastructure investment money goes to things like that. I don't know. Maybe someday, if anybody knows any experts on smart traffic lights, I'd love to <laughs> invite them onto the Nerd Show. Um, uh, then I posted a story about uh, former Trump officials uh, saying that there was no such thing as a, you know, one of the excuses that Trump gave about the search warrant was, oh, it's okay that I had top secret, compartmentalized, confidential state uh, secrets in my you know, cardboard boxes next to the uh, croquet set in Mar-a-Lago mansion. Because anything that I told my team to send to Florida, I gave a standing order to like automatically declassify it. And by the way, if you're enjoying this kind of Trump commentary, don't forget to like and share. Because <laughs> um, I see, notice there's still some people in the live stream, even though technically the main interview is over. Um, any rate, so that was his argument. Uh, one of his excuses that, no, no I'm okay, because uh, there was a standing order. And then basically people from his team are saying there was no such thing as a standing order. It's sort of like anything I touch belongs to me. Uh, I think my brother used to say that when I, we were in like elementary school. And I was like, what is that? But basically, yeah, my, your, 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 little, your older brother had a standing order that anything he looked at or, or wanted was his. It's kind of like <laughs> what Trump is asserting. I mean, the guy, this piece of work, his modus operandi is, I didn't do it, full stop. It's all a witch hunt, bullshit. Russia, 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 you know, but her emails, right? So I didn't do it. The second thing is, if I did do it, it would have been fine. In this case, because I had a standing order. Hey, that's, that's fine. It's not, it's not confidential. And then the third one is like, also, if you find anything that looks bad, it was planted by the FBI. I have no evidence of it, but I'm just telling you right now. It's sort of like, I won the election. If I didn't win, it's because it was rigged. And it was really, you know, Dominion that did it in for me. It's like, that's, that's it, the pattern. Like, we've seen this pattern. It's it's like dealing with some kind of narcissist who's just delusional. Um, 
Ooh, yeah. Then uh, I was talking about how I'm so happy that the U.S. Senate is going to uh, actually be one seat more in favor of Democrats in uh, December. And uh, I think it's because the Republican Party has been taken over by the MAGA extremists and Trump. Uh, ironically, they call old school Republicans rhinos, but they are the interlopers. They are the ones that kind of infiltrated the party. And they have now, in their infinite wisdom, nominated people like Mehmet Oz and Herschel Walker to huge statewide positions. And they will lose in the general because these elections are decided by independents and moderates and swing voters. And swing voters do not have 50 Trump MAGA flags in their front lawn and you know, scream about uh, things that aren't logically consistent. Um, you know, I just, it gets under my skin when I hear these MAGA extremists, you know, you just invoke the name of the Constitution, invoke the name of patriotism, and then they basically have blind loyalty to a king, which is like, the antithesis of the U.S. Constitution and what makes this country truly great. You should not be so loyal to one person that you are willing to justify anything they do at any time and always blame their political opponents for anything that's going wrong. Like That is not the American way. Uh, if the founding fathers saw the amount of just uh, abuse of power that King Donald has, has, has done and is trying to continue to do. Can you imagine a second term with that guy where he doesn't need to worry about re-election and he probably will hire even more yes men and, you know, attractive spokespeople? Oh, my God. It's just, it would be devastating. I don't know how we would, it would take us de decades to recover. God knows what he would do. What would he do with Putin and, and North Korea and China? Jesus, just to make himself look strong? Um, any rate, I know we're getting into the weekend and we're at the hour mark. So I want to thank everybody who hung around. If you're watching this on replay and you made it this far uh, and you're not subscribed, well, if you made it this far, I'm guessing you're already subscribed. But just like and share. That'd be a big favor to the channel. If you want to help us, keep going. Click the join link. And then don't forget to follow me on Twitter, uh, YouTube. Uh, subscribe. Audio podcasts. I update uh, every week on wherever you listen to audio podcasts. A lot of people don't know about the audio podcast which is basically the audio version of these live streams. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye, nerds. <laughs>